Okay, so good morning and welcome to the latest Blockchain Ireland monthly meeting for February. My name is Paul Hearns. I'm a journalist and commentator and I'll be your host and moderator this morning. Uh, we have a good program uh, as always and uh, we will have uh, insights from Australia uh, locally and some of the activity of uh, Blockchain Ireland um, uh, as well. So uh, I'm just going to hand over to our uh, steering group member, Professor Joyce O'Connor, for her opening remarks, and uh, then we will share the agenda for this morning. So, uh, Professor O'Connor. Thank you, Paul, and a very warm welcome to all of you this morning to the Blockchain Ireland Cluster Technology Ireland ICT Skills Net meeting. My name is Joyce O'Connor, co-founder and chair of Block W, a female-led organisation whose mission is to increase access and awareness to blockchain and other emerging technologies and to encourage equity and diversity in the uptake and use of uh, blockchain technologies. On behalf of the Blockchain Ireland Steering Committee, a particular welcome to all of you in the blockchain community. A lot has been happening since we last met in January in relation to blockchain in Ireland and in Europe, centered around education credentials, education and skills. Last week in Ireland, the IOB, the Institute of Banking, together with Bank of Ireland, AIB and Deloitte, announced the launch of unique blockchain-based education credentials platform, EdQ, which provides real-time access and an unalterable trusted store of education qualifications, regulatory and other professional developments. It's a world's first, so congratulations to all concerned. And we look to hear a, a lot more about this development in the coming months. In Europe, the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications, INATBA, published a report on blockchain education a prerequisite for socio-economic and technical advancement. It puts education from the grassroots to the executive board at the heart of the further development of a blockchain ecosystem. Finally, and links to this is the focus on education. The ESRI is undertaking a study funded by the European Commission, the Erasmus Programme. And this study is a transnational study with 13 other European partners on blockchain skills in Ireland within a European context. This project will help formulate an Irish and European strategy to address skills mismatches and shortages in the blockchain sector. An action plan will be developed to deliver appropriate and future focused education, training qualifications and mobility solutions geared to sectoral realities and needs. So we'll get back to you about that study. Uh, the theme today, as Paul said, we have a really exciting meeting. The theme today is about opportunities in creating a blockchain ecosystem. Dara Lawler will also pr pr brief you on Blockchain Ireland Week, uh, looking for your involvement and our participation. Our two keynote speakers are Steve Vallis and Fiona Delaney. Steve Vallis is CEO of Blockchain Australia. Steve will look at the Blockchain Australian's roadmap and tell us how his mission and vision of Blockchain Australia is to build confidence in the blockchain community. Three pillars he talks about very clearly, educate, evaluate, elevate and partnership. So we look forward, Steve, to your presentation. Fiona Delaney is co-founder and CEO of Blockchain uh, of Origin Chain Networks, an agri-tech firm and chair of the Blockchain Ireland Startup Group and a member of the steering group of Block W. Fiona is a national and European award winner. Her latest award is the EU Innovation and Standards Award 2020. Fiona will guide us through the DG Connect rollouts on initiatives for blockchain and emerging technologies, showing us the roadmap, suggesting how we can influence and use these initiatives as opportunities. So we have a very interesting and busy morning ahead. Dara, would you like to start really with the an overview of what's happening with Blockchain Ireland Week and then 
Paul can come in and introduce our speakers. So uh, we'd just like to give a quick update as regards uh, Blockchain Ireland Week. Um, uh, as we announced at our last uh, last meeting, um, we're uh, planning to go ahead with Blockchain Ireland Week in uh, May of this year, 24th of May, uh, under the overarching and uh, we've spoke previously about the goals, so I won't spend a huge amount of time talking about those here, um, other than to say that we're looking to gather as broad a gathering of uh, speakers, panelists, and teams as we possibly can uh, to reach uh, the largest audience. I suppose the main thing will be that those the main pillars that we're looking to address are around enterprise, startup, academic, social impact, international, and obviously tech technology. Um, so uh, our approach on that, just to recap from what we said last week, is, uh, is an, initially to cast the net as widely as possible uh, and to get as many uh, contributors as we can through crowdsourcing a long list. And we've been working on that at the moment. Um, that list, we'd originally uh, set a cut off of this week. We've had good response, but we think there's room for more, particularly from uh, the membership and attendees on this uh, in this forum. So we're extending out to uh, Friday week uh, to close off submissions there. Um, there was a link um, circulated um, on, on, on an email from Dave Feenan uh, last month, and we will recirculate that link straight after this meeting. Um, so uh, in terms of the timeline, we're looking at getting our long list of crowdsourced speakers and content ready for review and curation now by the 5th of March. Um, and we would like to see, uh, and we've got roughly 50 uh, speakers and teams in there. That might sound like a lot, but when you look at there may be three or four people on a panel, that quickly shrinks. So we want to, uh, we want to look to, um, uh, we've got a pretty diverse bunch of uh, speakers and teams going everything from um, uh, small artisan producers looking to use blockchain for provenance up to big enterprise use cases and everything in between. But what we would like to do is to ask this group, particularly when we're looking out to the regions and we're looking for a, a good, diverse collection of speakers, presenters, and teams, we'd like to look to this audience uh, to uh, put the thinking caps on and come back to us with any ideas you might have uh, or to volunteer to speak or panel yourselves. It's a very brief form. And we'd be grateful if, if you could put your thinking caps on and come back to us. So uh, by way of status, where we are at the moment is that on the event content side, we're in good shape. As I've said, we've got around 50 uh, panelists available and identified for curation to date. Um, our working group is not terribly well resourced. And at the moment, we only have three members. So we're looking again out to this group to uh, see if we can get more volunteers. You can contact uh, myself or Paul Hearns directly on that. Um, we'd like to see some more people coming on board. There's going to be a lot to do. Uh, we're looking to make this to be a big, impactful event. Uh, and thus, we're looking for assistance um, in uh, running work streams to do with the event, participation, coordination, registration, uh, the web page, survey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the content crowdsourcing side, uh, we haven't had a great response to date uh, with about uh, six events uh, having been submitted formally through the member portal. And we're really hoping that we can improve on that and broaden the, uh, the input into this event from purely uh, a steering uh, committee perspective. So we're really hoping that this call to arms will get people going and we get an email with that link refreshed back out to everybody at the end of uh, this meeting. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. We'll be giving an update uh, every month and uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, bringing you news of a much expanded uh, panel of uh, speakers and teams uh, when we meet next month. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to talk now, please. Thanks very much, Dara. It looks like an uh, exciting um, opportunity for people to be involved in Blockchain Ireland Week. And I'm sure you'll get lots of people uh, volunteering, but also looking to participate in the week. Uh, so uh, we really ask all of you uh, who's interested to get in touch with uh, Dara and Paul. Let's kick off. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
Uh, look, it's the end of the the end of the day here as opposed to the start of the day. I have to say, twelve hours into the day, I'm I'm as enthusiastic about this subject matter as I could possibly be. There's a lot to talk about in the space, and I and I welcome the opportunity to talk to Blockchain Island because I think critically important at the moment when it comes to the subject of, uh, of blockchain and DLT, uh, we're not the majority in many rooms. So given that we are uh, some believers, some true believers, some people that are investigating the space. I think it's important to have these international conversations and learn from each other's experience. So I appreciate that the uh, uh, Joyce that you reached out to me to sort of ask about what ours what ours was. Um, Blockchain Australia is the organisation I represent. I've been in that role for approximately eight months. Uh, the the job interview process someone asked me about. They said how long did it take? I said about four years. So for four <laughs> years, I've worked in the space. And, and met and spoken to many, many people. So hopefully today I'm gonna to encourage as many questions as possible. I can frame them from the perspective of what it is from an association perspective to build this sort of community. I can frame them from the perspective of uh, government and what government is doing that's making an enormous difference to us here locally. And from the community perspective that are a wide variety of, of, of verticals, um, where the success and where the strength and weaknesses are. I think it's important to share the fact that every time I speak to international organisations in particular, we all seem to peer over everyone else's fence and we look longingly at what it is that someone else is doing and we, we see wins that we hope and wish we had in our own jurisdiction. But the truth is every jurisdiction I think is struggling with a, with a lot of challenges, um, some regulatory, some finance from the perspective of investment, some government, all those things are conversations that continue to, uh, to be challenging I think to everybody. So it's a shared experience um, uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. When I took on the role at BA, I made a public announcement, pronouncement that I would speak to no less than a thousand people in the first hundred days. And that was a very deliberate exercise in uh, giving the community voice. And I think the challenge has been sometimes the voices, uh, the loudest voices aren't necessarily ref reflective of what the industry is or aspires to be. So importantly, I think as a, as a community, just going in and having those conversations and understanding what context people find themselves in I think that served us well. And, and what I'm finding, of course, in those conversations is everyone has stakeholder management issues. So often for us, the conversation is not about technology. It's how people make the case for this technology within their own organization or outside. So that's something that is, that is consistent. You know, I find a lot of technologists who I speak to who can build a solution to the problem, but the truth is you've got to convince people uh, they want a solution and then go through the process, obviously, of trying to, uh, to get them to implement it. So they're, they're challenges uh, at the outset of conversations and relationships in the, in the space. Uh, the backstory from the Australian perspective as well was uh, relevant to where we are now, because in some respects, we still suffer from the ghosts of Christmas past with respect to what, uh, what has come before. So the scene setting in an Australian perspective is in 2017, 2018, when there was a lot of noise in the in the space, you know, we participated as the world did in ICOs, and there were some funds that flowed into Australia, um, not disproportionately. I think the truth is, outside of a few key jurisdictions, flows were very significant uh, in a limited number of places. We saw some revenue that came in. Most of those projects uh, have not ultimately come to pass, or they're still working their way through. They still have challenges. One of the things that's been important in the framing of the narrative that, that I try to tell is judge these sorts of startups the same way you would judge most others. You know, they were, were sometimes ill-considered, sometimes poorly funded. Um, you know, the narrative that people bought into, which is it must be a scam if it's related to blockchain, is something that persists in many, many rooms. And I just say, let's let's judge them as startups. You know, were, were they businesses ready for their time? And I wouldn't begrudge people for getting some financing early. Um, the truth is most businesses struggle to get finance and never and never do. So that's a critical part of the legacy of that 2017 and 2018 landscape. The other thing that was critical in that, in that framing is many people made a decision about this ecosystem in 2017 and 18 and have not revisited that conversation. So I find myself in many rooms saying, what is your view? And they will say, I looked at it. And then the question I'll ask is, when did you look at it? And have you revisited it? So a lot of that legacy um, comes from that, uh, from that period of time. And the narratives that build around that, and again, these aren't unique to the Australian jurisdiction, are things related to the dark web or illicit uh, money exchange, or as I said, a scam. That, that, that's an easy narrative for people to buy into and notwithstanding the attention that all that uh, sort of the, the, the hubris of 2017 and 18 created, 
it now feels like we're still clearing um, that mess. That's a local challenge here as well, which is why, as Joyce pointed out before, the key for us is confidence with respect to this. That says, you know, a lot has changed since then. If you formed a view, then uh, it would be of an opportune time to um, to revisit that that view. So we kept going through that uh, that process, and then things changed materially for us in Australia in 2019. Uh, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, a very large portfolio at a federal level, um, committed to a blockchain roadmap in Australia. And it's not an insignificant step. There were other roadmaps in other spaces, such as cybersecurity and uh, IoT and, and the like. And what that meant was it pulled us into line and said, here is another subject matter. Here's, here's something that requires some attention. That was a really strong signal and a lot of expectation built up around that roadmap. The roadmap was released in February 2020, and it was released to a, a tepid response in some respects. And the reason I think it was misconstrued, and I've said publicly many times, is because the government didn't fund the roadmap. They didn't say, here's what we've decided, and here is some money for what we decided. At the time, I made the observation, and I continue to believe that was the best decision, because the truth is, we shouldn't be asking government to pick winners for us in a technology sense. So if they were forced at that stage to pick winners, I think they wouldn't have been well prepared to pick the winners. So for that perspective, I sort of looked at it and said, it's important because it is the first step. And uh, right. that has been critical for us in the growth of the, uh, the ecosystem and the interest around the sector. Uh, what the government did do was they looked at the strengths of the Australian economy and they looked at our own uh, natural tendency to gravitate towards subject matter and chose some spaces to start the conversation. So the roadmap identified four key subject matters. One was supply chain, one was credentials, uh, the other was KYC and AML issues, and uh, and uh, the fourth one there for us was RegTech. So I left, deliberately leave RegTech um, uh, sort of last. Oh, sorry, there was also ultimately cyber security that came, uh, that came through. Um, those, those use cases are our strengths. When, when it comes to supply chain, Australia's supply chain and the integrity of supply chains are critically important. So it's easy to draw conversation into what are our strengths. So I, I think that's a good strategy for governments in general. Uh, it was the case again with credentials broadly and when you involve the tertiary education ecosystem, Australia is an e exporter of education services. So again, mm. an, a logical spot for us to start. Um, the AML KYC issues were kind of parked because as you all oh, well, no, no doubt. It's a fraught area. There are lots of views about what should or shouldn't be done. So I think we've just put pause that for a second. And the other two use cases that were drawn in are reflective of national priorities. One, cybersecurity, because it's a it's an issue for all sovereign uh, governments. You know, this is something we should be looking at. Um, and red tech, because there is not a single room I talk blockchain and DLT about without the conversation around, we need certainty in regulatory and tech environments. Now that narrative applies everywhere. I, I hear it in Israel, I hear it in Singapore, I hear it in the UK, I hear it in Ireland, I hear it in the US. So they're the use cases uh, that were chosen ultimately uh, by the government. And I think they were a fair place to start. Uh, what ended up happening was those use cases were chosen, a steering committee was chosen, I was lucky enough to be involved in that steering committee and ultimately working groups have been set up to investigate four of the five excluding the AML KYC issue and again all of these are measured steps into the ecosystem and they aim to build confidence because we're investigating potential use cases uh, with a view to identifying how they fit or don't fit into an Australian um, context. That, that's critical. Now we're in the process of preparing reports. The federal government will receive reports from the four working groups over the coming uh, months on that subject matter. And that again is now the second step, as far as I'm concerned. It goes back into departments that don't have deep subject matter expertise here. And it asks of those departments, um, do this, does this connect the dots for you? Is it something that might be of, uh, of interest? So uh, additionally, and again, these are signals that matter, um, some funding, some dedicated funding was put towards two projects in the last Australian budget. It was $6.9 million for um, two projects. And it was enough to get a lot of excitement in the community because it was the first time that it looked like dedicated funding would be provided to the ecosystem. So we keep looking for firsts and we, we gravitate towards a period of time where firsts are no longer the measure of success for us. It's just the reinforcement of these of these messages. So that's that's the way the Australian ecosystem has moved, uh, has moved forward. So that confidence has started to build um, and it means now in the Australian context, we can start plugging into other 
uh, ecosystem priorities. One of the things for me in, in Blockchain Australia's success in recent months has been, I don't put blockchain in the center of the conversation because the truth is in most rooms, it doesn't belong there. So my aim is to contextualize for others. So I sort of say almost, meanwhile, here's what's happening in Australia, much as it's the case uh, across uh, many uh, different jurisdictions, because the consumer data right, which has been very prominent in, uh, in, in England, um, is also being rolled out here. It's a subject matter that has interest. We had, uh, we had a financial services Royal Commission. There's interest in, in banking. So all the things where there is interest is where we're sort of gravitating towards at the moment. So it's much easier to build enthusiasm and interest in those sorts of rooms. And that's what we seek to do from Blockchain Australia's uh, perspective. And we're doing with some degree of success. Um, the issue then of uh, reg and regulation and reg tech is a critical one. It's, it's something now, particularly given in the context of stimulus spending and governments that know that efficiency needs to be created in economies. Um, and also that this is a potentially a once in a lifetime, you know, generational opportunity with respect to um, the digital economy being established. We, we've recognised that and there is an understanding outside of blockchain and DLT uh, rooms that this is a subject matter we should be leaning in on. So I've almost described the, the, the general description of reg tech as the front door of the house for everybody at the moment because reg tech creates confidence. You are talking about um, being aware of things, you know, compliance costs, compliance processes, not changing the system. It's a nice conversation starter. So from a community perspective, it's one of the things I would encourage uh, the, the blockchain island community to say, understand that that's the kind of thing that builds confidence much more than we can, we can change all of the systems. That's, a, that's something that is an experience here in, um, in Australia. So from my perspective now, where does it leave the Australian jurisdiction? Um, we do not have, as is the case with most uh, countries, enormous inflows of investment such that we build our own protocols. You know, we're not a protocol building environment at the moment. We don't have hundreds of million dollars invested to build base layer infrastructure. Um, we're much more an economy that can focus and build application layer. So strengths and weaknesses with respect to uh, um, sort of our existing circumstances. So, you know, I encourage a lot of people who, to build on application layers. At the same time, I'm trying to encourage inbound investment from the protocols that are building out infrastructure for us to build to build on. Uh, I think that's one of the critical things for us. You know, when I tell stories of the Australian startup ecosystem, it's fair to say that the blockchain and the DLT environment is underserviced. And it relates to all the things that I've done as the history lesson uh, that makes it very difficult for people to uh, take on these projects because they just don't have that subject matter expertise in relation to it. So if we know that's a bit of a gap. So again, that's an inbound exercise for me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find investment that sort of comes through. The export for us, if you move up the stack when it comes to these businesses, our professional services businesses are well regarded, our regulatory frameworks are well regarded, large businesses are willing to give this consideration. So uh, when you talk, you talk to things like consulting firms and the like, clearly well placed for us to, to lead a conversation from those. So it's not quite the sometimes a more attractive story that is the startup bottom up, but consistently for me, I've said to government that this really is an exercise in giving confidence from the top down and ultimately we think investment will flow into the, uh, into the startup uh, ecosystem. So why it's important again to draw the conversation of the international perspective, the truth is no one wants to fall behind. So I've deliberately tried to inform um, our regulators, our government, our enterprise businesses of what's happening globally. And uh, I don't find a lot of people or enough people lift their head up to say, oh, this is what's happening overseas and then bring that information back in. I, I sat, uh, at a Senate hearing a couple of weeks ago, and I spoke to one of the senators in charge of the, of the committee, whose aim is to revisit RegTech and um, uh, FinTech frameworks. And the whole point of my presentation in that environment was to say, in the UK, or sorry, the EU, MICA is being considered in real time. It's driving conversations around CBDCs and regulatory frameworks. I know that in England, there's a recent request for information with respect to how we, um, regulate crypto assets and digital assets. Um, China is building out the blockchain services network. They're moving forward at pace. Uh, China is also obviously running out testing for their, uh, their retail CBDC. The US was an interesting one for me, and I think it's the thing that ultimately spurs interest in this space. They could get a lot wrong and still win when they get things right. That's the nature of the US economy. So when you start looking at what the US has done in the last six, uh, six or seven months, in isolation, you say, well, maybe they haven't moved. But then when you look closely, 
And the US through the OCC and through FinCEN and through the SEC have encouraged banks and almost said to banks, you should bank and participate in this space. These are businesses that should not be discriminated against. Um, they've allowed banks to um, test the, the technology. They've said, you can play with nodes, you can run this infrastructure, very strong signal. The SEC has created a dedicated office with respect to digital assets. FinCEN is giving um, clarity with respect to what payments look like and, uh, and FATF style rules that, uh, that disclose what those payments look like. Wyoming has issued some banking licenses. Uh, I think the OCC just issued a national banking license. This just happened. Literally six or seven months of activity seems to be the US saying, we're gonna start unleashing the power of the financial services ecosystem into this technology. So there really is no better time for us to be uh, making a determination about what sort of role we seek to, we seek to play. So where does it leave Australia? Uh, we need a mix of inbound and outbound interest. You know, from the community's perspective, I'm trying to do what Blockchain Island is doing, which is I want to make sure that people identify themselves and their capabilities. And I want to make sure that they are elevated long enough that people get comfortable with them. I'm similarly doing a Blockchain Week in, uh, in April. And my aim is not to tell a story as a point in time exercise. My aim is to tell the story of the community at an elevated pitch long enough that people then look around and realise that we broadly in a blockchain DLT community, we are in every room. That's the reality. I mean, when I go into a financial services room, I see us there. Reg tech room, we're there. We're in supply chain rooms. You know, we're in, we're in government rooms where all these things are of implication. We are in every room. And it kind of feels like I'm going in and turning on the light one by one. And that's the only role I should play in some of those rooms is just to turn the light on a little bit to give us that, uh, to give us that confidence. So, uh, happily for me, this is a relationship that's now been commenced and the truth is I think the ability to talk across <coughs> jurisdictions um, is a valuable, a valuable one. So I think we should uh, lean in on each other's strengths and weaknesses and uh, wherever the opportunity arises, uh, I'm happy to play that role uh, on the community build. Um, we have a membership base. I say to people consistently, you don't need to invest in me, but we want you to invest something into the community. Invest your time, invest your effort, and if it needs to be, make a financial investment. But I always use that as the bar. Are people willing to commit um, personal resources, primarily time as the, as the litmus test? If you're willing to do that, then there's a place for in our community and a place, a place for me to contribute to others. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, Paul, I'll, I'll leave you to uh, ask a few questions if any have come through, but I'd encourage uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. I think Paul has left us. The wind has got him at this stage. So thank you very much for a really um, uplifting and inspiring account of what's happening in Australia, Steve. I'd just like, before, there's a number of questions coming in, but I'd just like to ask you, because um, I've read some of the um, the blogs and things that you've, you've, you've had, and also your contribution to that um, to, to the government meeting there the last couple of weeks. And do you think, because we're on a kind of a similar path as, you, as you've identified, is government key? What you said, you know, in 2019, government said, we're going to come into this space. Is that the first step that is essential? Do you need government to commit and focus on this technology? as you say, not just as the technology, but as something that can solve problems and can help reinvent the future, particularly at this stage? Uh, Joyce, I don't think it works without government, but my view of what government needs to do versus what government's normally asked to do are two different things. You know, I, when, I, when I presented at the Senate hearing, I, I didn't ask for money from government. No, I didn't say, yeah. give us money to fund us. And, and I guess the challenge is the perpetual Request is, of course, give us money. Your government, you should be spurring these things. And I, I, I trust people to innovate. I trust business to innovate. Yeah. And I think and government should be the guardrail for these things. So the signalling exercise from government is critically important. And and uh, you know, it's amazing. A little thing with the benefit of hindsight makes a, an enormous uh, difference as far as I'm concerned. So that's the critical bit is saying to government, this should be on your agenda. Um, we're not saying rush out and fund it in the same way. Don't push people out of the way in order to do that. It's much more an exercise than saying, identify it as something that you give others confidence to, to, uh, yeah. to look at. And I think that's predicated primarily on this reg the, the regulatory sort of uh, challenge. Because 
I keep saying to people consistently, be careful what you wish for. Because yes. if you ask government for certainty, they might give it to you, Joyce, and it might not be the certainty you want. So what you want is the confidence to do things, to investigate things, to test, not tell us what's right or wrong, because the reality there is there's not a lot of innovation when you're being told, here's the binary outcome available to you, in or out. So that's that's the key, and that's part of the yes. encouragement of the community build around it, is to, is to give confidence to people, say, yep, let, let them test um, within, within, a, within a zone, things like, uh, you know, fintechs doing uh, sandboxes are a classic sort of example. Uh, innocuous, relatively innocuous, supply chain is, is, is pretty friendly. You know, there's, there's not this fear that you're creating a new kind of anything. All you're trying to say is we're, we're improving provenance or ultimately we, um, we're trying to create efficiency. So it's a natural place to start. The question once you start that conversation is how quickly you can move into um, other sectors. Yeah, but it's a first start. I have a number of questions here now. Well, first one is from Kevin Hart, and he says, Hi, Steve. Is the focus of the cybersecurity use case about developing blockchain technology in cybersecurity ex execution as a technology to deliver cybersecurity or about the cybersecurity risk management within around the blockchain technology or both? Uh, it's a beautiful question, Joyce. It's the one we, we actually had to deal with at first instance in the, in the group. Uh, and the, what we ultimately came to the conclusion we should do at first instance, because remembering these are dot connecting exercises when we go back to government with the report is blockchain people are more uh, are less averse to risk. The truth is when you talk about things like decentralized finance, like they're building out robust systems in real time because they're under attack right now. Um, so that ecosystem and that part of it, which is blockchains uh, own sort of cyber requirements, that's just being done. Whereas for us, we decided to focus much more on how can blockchain potentially make more traditionally viewed cybersecurity better. And that, that's the exercise. It's improve existing systems much more than it is go the other, the other path. But it's, it's a challenging one because, you know, my experience has been I'm the co-chair of that particular working group. And cyber people don't spend a lot of time thinking about blockchain. So you sort of, again, going into someone else's room and saying, this might make it better. And the truth is, it's already a growing space. It's a space that, that suffers from a lack of skills as well, because there's such a shortage because the space is growing so quickly. So again, it's it's a very early discussion in those rooms. It's, it's not a, nat you're not naturally embraced, but that's the way we've looked at it. How do we make cyber better with blockchain? Okay. Great. Another question from Dave Feenan. Uh, it says, thanks for your presentation. What are the two, three key objectives of the Blockchain Ireland strategy? And what can Ireland learn from those objectives? Uh, I think the main one is blockchain is Australia's strategy. Sorry, and what can we learn from those objectives? I think the I think the main thing is don't get frustrated at things that have to take too long, and don't hang around with things that don't. I mean, that, okay. that's the thing because, because the reality on the, uh, I said from the government perspective, some things will take one, two, five, ten years. That's just the nature of the process. You know, banging on the door, you know, more in a more pronounced way doesn't aid us. So it's you sort of just have to work with what is reasonable yeah. and practical. And then and then if it's not the solution you like, um, you know, just just get better outcomes, go a different way. So I think that's one of the what's one of the things that we try yeah, to that's, do. That's good advice. Thanks for that, Steve. <laughs> Alan, Ka Alan Kavnas asked, it says, fascinating start to your talk. Thank you very much, Steve. Great clarity. What do you think might be Australia's USP with regards to DLT and blockchain technology? Or by focusing on reg tech, do you ever feel you lose many of the diehard decentralists in the Australian blockchain community? Uh, it, it's a little bit of a... Uh, uh, again, a terrific question. Um, theory and reality, I guess, is the way I'd sort of do it. We're, we're not a jurisdiction that uh, embraces a decentralised mindset. We're just not. I mean, the, the, the nature of the the the, uh, the regulatory framework, for example, there is a compliant framework um, that we operate in. We're, we're not that. We're not the wild west. So, from that perspective, I say to some people that have grand plans, where if you say you know privacy is above all the number one consideration, I say maybe it's not the jurisdiction to build that that project and sort of I'm happy to give sort of frank advice so I think that that part of the ecosystem is is difficult to make work in Australia that's the that's the truth and I think the reality of the regulatory framework and um, the nature with the, the, the way we approach these things they're more suited to things like reg tech or supply chain much more than they are centralized networks there's a caveat Joyce which is something I've been finding that's really interesting for me we're building up a lot of decentralized finance um, uh, capability and I think that's because 
most people who are in DeFi or many people who are in DeFi are building yeah. things for themselves. So okay. they, they don't, they're not having to bring in resources. They're just, they love it. So, you know, wherever you are. So I think it's likely to be the case that in a jurisdiction like uh, Ireland as well, if people understand the tech, they'll just build it for themselves. So it's not, you know, they're not building consulting businesses, they're building products. So I think that's, that's something which might just uh, shoot up alongside sure. this uh, other view. Well, as a follow on to that, Steve, Regina Dunn asked the question, what type of jobs do you see evolving around blockchain? Why should someone study blockchain? I think I can tell you as someone who did a law degree and didn't practice for too long, but even even uh, you know a couple of decades ago, when I came out of the um, uh, the education system, there were lots of lawyers in front of me, and there were many lawyers waiting to be qualified behind me. So the, the you are making your way through a very dense forest of skill sets. I've never seen a greenfield opportunity like this before in my life, and right. and it's just it's moved so quickly that the truth is no one can say to any of us. I've been in this space for 10 years because basically no one has been in this space for 10 years. So, so for me, it's just opportunity. So, you know, that, and, and that, that's one reason. The other reason is I think it's, it's a great leveler. The, the truth is you can be 22 years of age and give consideration to building these things and you can be 62 years of age. Mm -hmm. I don't see the same impediment because you don't need that pedigree that says I've been doing this for this length of time. So for me, it's just, it's opportunity. And, and I described it as 360 degrees surround sound, it, depending on which bit you like, there is something being built out in that direction. So you don't have to worry about being circumscribed with this, this single thing that says, this is what blockchain is. Just it's, it's pick your own flavor and then, and then charge towards it. Well, on, on that really positive note, Steve, um, I, I'll thank you because as I said earlier, this, this session was about opportunity and I, I think you've set it out very well. And it's been very, very helpful uh, hearing you talk about your journey and the positive thing about focusing on opportunities and that it's open to everybody. And that's what Blockchain Ireland is about. We want to encourage everybody to look at the, at the opportunities and see does it fit in with them and then help provide the infrastructure for that to happen. So thank you very much, Steve. As ever, you've been inspirational. Um, and I hope you'll stay on uh, for Fiona's bit as a uh, contribution as well. So uh, thanks, Steve. So it's over to you, Fiona. Um, Fiona, who, who I know very well, um, I, I don't know how to introduce you other than that you've been an inspiring person in the blockchain sector for, for a number of years. And your work within Europe, I think, has been really quite amazing in that you've won not only awards for yourself and your company, but in fact, I, am I right in saying that our, this is the first blockchain award uh, within the European um, context. So congratulations on that. So I know today what you're going to do is, is give us an overview, a, another roadmap on how we and everybody here might negotiate Europe and look for the opportunities that are there. So thanks very much, Fiona. It's over to you now. Okay, so um, I am delighted to be speaking straight after Steve, who gave a really fantastic overview of um, that sort of watchful space between a connector between uh, the ecosystem, which is kind of like popcorn, people fixing and making solutions for themselves, and then more infrastructure based or more uh, reg tech based and um, compliance focused kind of uh, approaches, which is very much what we're seeing coming out of Europe. So I'm going to talk about a series that has been run by DG Connect and the policy section there. It's a series of roundtables that began last October on ICT verticals and horizontals for blockchain standardization. And it was a way of bringing together projects of excellence, uh, both within the European context, largely funded through European Horizon uh, initiatives, and also to connect with standards development organizations and where um, international practice could uh, uh, influence or give insight, um, uh, people were invited to come and speak. So very interestingly, this um, initiative has taken a, a use case based uh, methodology or approach to sharing uh, both knowledge and practice, but also as a means to identifying gaps in uh, standardization and the whole purpose of standardization is really 
uh, to promote interoperability at a, at a global level, particularly when we're talking about technology and how we can cooperate and collaborate. Um, so the general context is <clears throat> within uh, DG Connect, we're talking about forging or shaping Europe's digital future. Uh, there's the EU strategy for data is there was a consultation in 2020 and it's really an emerging um, uh, strategy. Uh, and one of the quotes from that is that there is a, a new, decentral, new decentralized digital technologies offer individuals and companies an opportunity to manage their data flows and the usage of data based on individual choices and self-determination. That's very much a European focus. We see that with GDPR, citizens' rights, data ownership, self-sovereign identity, and how important it is to um, empower the data subject in database systems. So these kind of technologies that we're talking about, decentralized technologies, decentralized ledger technologies, uh, make this idea of dynamic data portability in real time possible. And when um, our previous speaker, Steve, was talking about those different applications, that concept of dynamic data portability in real time is the key to what uh, cooperative and distributed systems can offer uh, um, in a secure way or in an immutable way or in a way that adds trust. Um, so I've added in a link down here, which is the European and Irish regulatory context is really the European Electronic Communications Code. That's really the context that we're talking about. And we see over here on the right hand side, how Europe has a uh, has, has, a, has kind of started to explore blockchain technology. First of all, they established the value by um, forming the blockchain partnership, European blockchain partnership that happened in April, 2018. Then they established intent. These are steps in innovation management. By December, 2019, they had uh, initiated a pre-commercial procurement project with through the EBC infrastructure and now 2020 late in 2020 they're offering infrastructure through the um, EBC services and all of the links are here so I really encourage people to dig into this and what's on offer um, and start to participate because there is um, the, the idea with EBC and this node infrastructure is that it's open source, it's available to everybody uh, to kind of mess around with. In particular, EBC focuses on a reform of public sector um, uh, processes, I would say. And uh, there's something there about reformatting the interface between the public sector and the private sector or between the community or the citizenry or the industry. And that that's a really, uh, important interface, which is being um, yeah, restructured. Let me just move on here. So these are, I'm not going to talk about these. In fact, my presentation is a lot of other people's slides and I've just included them by way of illustration. Um, Steve earlier on was talking about being in different rooms and how uh, understanding what is happening within those rooms is really quite important. So these, this selection here are sample submissions that were made from the public consultation to the European strategy for data. There's some really interesting work happening in med tech, um, in, you know, mobility, uh, you know, autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles, all that kind of stuff. And there's some examples here about um, what uh, the European strategy for data is and how it might impact within those sectors. Um, so the series itself was launched in October 2020 by Petrius Zilgadis, the head of the unit in DG Connect. The roundtables focused on, um, in Europe, we call them verticals. I think Steve has a much better word, he called them rooms. Um, so this is the series of events here on the right hand side. So the first one was fintech, digital assets and smart grids. The second was digital society, identity and privacy. So they're pretty big topic headings, which encompass both technical and social aspects or even economic aspects. So um, 
The roundtables used a use case format to identify gaps and to encourage contributions to ICT standardization across application domains. Each of the events was co-hosted with INACBA, which is a industry uh, organization kind of coming together to develop and identify uh, emerging needs for the, the blockchain uh, sector. And it featured contributions from Senelec, ISO and IEEE, as well as Stand ICT. So I was participating um, because of my work with ISO. I'm the technical lead of the use case lab in TC307 for blockchain use cases. Um, the, 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 the comment there from the um, from the rolling plan, the European rolling plan about blockchain is identifies it as infrastructure for trusted decentralized and disintermediated services, even beyond the financial sector. And it leads to major political innovation, redefining the way we operate transactions, access information and share data. That comes from a European Commission website. So I, I think uh, when we're talking to government or the public sector here, this kind of language and the, the ambition at the heart of Europe for the potential of this kind of technology is so far advanced um, that they are really, um, really committed to openness and, uh, and innovation. Uh, and I think we need in blockchain Ireland and in Ireland, we need to really understand that that capacity is there and move forward and play into that rather than catch up or, or hang around. So, <clears throat> so the, the, I'm not gonna tell you what a blockchain is. Uh, I'm just gonna quote ISO. Blockchain is a distributed ledger with confirmed blocks organized in an append only sequential chain using cryptographic links. It is about technology and it's a way of doing stuff in, in technical terms. Uh, it's not gonna change the world and it's not gonna change your life. It's just gonna move data around the place uh, or store it. So what I've done, and I'm not gonna spend an awful lot of time on each of these next slides is to include for each of those um, vertical events, I've selected two uh, use cases that were presented and included uh, some of their slides um, uh, just by way of sharing information. I also have a list of all the projects that participated and if anybody is particularly interested in one or other of the topics they can uh, check them out and empower themselves with knowledge. Uh, so these two here there's uh, Italy and Ireland. My colleagues in uh, the Tyndall Research Centre submitted a use case to ISO TC307 and it's a really interesting prosumer microgrid project. Um, and you can see uh, some of that there. The, the, the one from Italy uh, is from a company called Stone Eyes. It's a transparent securitization project and they're using relatively new uh, blockchain called Algorand. This one here, Digital Society Identity and Privacy features uh, an award-winning uh, Dutch company called Wordproof, really exciting project. They uh, content timestamp, um, uh, your, your digital content on the web. They started, they're called WordProof because they started off as this nat, really natty little plugin for WordPress. And now they're compatible across multiple CRN systems. Uh, and they've recently been invested in by Yoast, which is a uh, massive SEO uh, initiative. And they're essentially making blockchain and content timestamping an, an essential part of using the web and uh, discovery and proof of uh, either originality or how long your, your, your content has been available and how, how um, authentic it is, I guess. Uh, it's a really interesting project and what they're offering is, um, uh, is accelerating at a really, really interesting uh, level or interesting way. The second project here is from Spain it's the Olympus project and it's from the University of Murcia who are really active in both the cybersecurity space, the IoT space. And this project here is, um, is, a, is an application of the W3C verified credential use case. Um, FC has an, a kind of uh, a notarization use case, which is maybe somewhat similar, but this one is W3C. Um, okay. 
digital economy and SMEs. I have selected two here. One is from China, um, Newsoft Enterprise Systems. As Steve was saying, the Chinese are really rolling out kind of infrastructure in the background that is essentially based on blockchain, completely modular, um, and it's almost like governance as a service. Uh, it's really, really interesting how they're scaling adoption. It's very fast paced and very, very interesting. This one on the right is my own one from uh, Origin Chain Networks, and it is uh, a use case called Universal Farm Compliance. Uh, and it is uh, the example here is built on the EBC node infrastructure, which is Hyperledger BESI. Uh, it's a, a, an Ethereum client on Hyperledger. Cybersecurity, I know there was a question earlier on about cybersecurity. And this one on the left is um, from the EU cybersecurity strategy from 2020. And it looks, it spells out here the threat vectors for blockchain and how they're being considered in that cybersecurity strategy context. And again, on the right, we have the University of Mercia CyberSec for Europe Global Functional Architecture, exploring blockchain and the implications for cybersecurity and what it gives and what it maybe detracts or what threats it brings. Some really interesting work happening there. IoT. There's some really great work happening in IoT. This uh, these slides here are from the IEEE and from uh, IOTEX, which uses Ethereum um, and the work that they're doing there. It's, it, unfortunately, while a load of companies are involved in IoT applications well, and they're using blockchain, they're not really looking over the hedge and they're not really sharing that knowledge at the moment, probably because as emerging technologies, we're kind of at the bleeding edge, I suppose, and don't always have time to look up uh, uh, over the hedge, I suppose. So I would say that IoT and blockchain and that convergence is really at the beginning of exploring uh, the requirements from both sides in terms of emerging standards. Uh, what blockchain brings in that context is it requires an exploration of governance interoperability and what does that mean when we're talking about IOT we're essentially talking about machine to machine data exchange and in blockchains the way the the, the Chinese uh, examples tend to see it is that uh, blockchains are used where humans are involved so it creates a trust layer where humans are involved so do we need a blockchain for for IOT or do we need it for the interface so there's a lot of interesting work and discussions happening at that point. E-health. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, they changed the way that they held the events, so I don't get the slides anymore. So after, so from e-health, which was uh, the last uh, event, um, all I can show you is uh, web pages from those projects. Uh, so onto chain is a new system ecosystem for trusted, traceable and transparent ontological knowledge. That is a that's a funding program, essentially, uh, and it is um, looking for and supporting emerging projects in sectors. So it could be agri tech, it could be supply chain, it could be e-health um, and looking to create ontologies or syntaxes or terminal common ground, the, the semantic web common ground for interoperability. Uh, and they're taking a very applied use to how our, our approach to how that is uh, rolling out. So that is an open funding project at the moment. Uh, and then the gatekeeper project is a very successful project that is using a uh, blockchain in the background. So this is the full list of all the projects. So you can just Google any of those and you will see on the top uh, uh, which uh, event they presented at. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see what the forthcoming events are and that tomorrow there is one on the future internet, media and big data. On the 24th of March, there's one on the UN SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals. That would be considered in ISO terms, that's considered a uh, a well it's a category that we have um iso as uh, and sensenelec and uh, uh the ieee i think as well have all adopted the, the un sdgs are widely adopted as a way of 
categorizing and classifying um, application domains or activity sections and how that impacts sustainability, global sustainability. So there's in April and June, there's going to be smart contracts and AI. They're going to be really interesting because it's the cutting edge, really, that, in, in, that interaction between those convergence technologies. So how do you get involved? Lurker or contributor? Stand ICT can help fund you if you're interested in getting involved. In NAFPA, if you're in industry and want to uh, network in that way. ISO, uh, Sense Enelec, and of course our own NSAI, uh, National Standards Authority of Ireland, are very active and very, um, very high quality in terms of how they're providing support to individual experts here and how we can contribute at international and global levels. Um, as I said before, I am the, the, the technical lead at the use case lab. So if anybody has a blockchain project and would like to contribute it to this, this wider body of uh, global use case examples, uh, just um, contact me and I can step you through it. Uh, the kind of analyses the, that we do, we look at implementation types, the, the sort of state of your use case. We can see here the um, the split between public and private uh, blockchains on the right hand side, about half and half in, in the ISO use cases, about half are using a public blockchain and half are, are, are only uh, permissioned. And then why would you do this? What's, what's the point <laughs> in looking at use cases? And this is a pretty poor quality here, but this slide from NSAI is from the innovation management system framework, which is an ISO five, 6,000 series, um, and the move from ad hoc to systemic innovation management uh, looks at um, creating concepts, identifying opportunities and validating concepts, which is this area here where the big X is before going on to developing solutions. So looking at use cases, describing them in a common way, like in the, using the ISO framework or the ISO use case template means that information can be shared across um, sectoral divides and application domains and can really capture um, both technically and in a business way um, the, the, the business context of how the use case or the business case is being deployed and, and that information becomes really vital to so many of us in, the, in this space. As, as Steve mentioned already, as we all know, it's really, really fast moving. So uh, thank you very much um, for, your, for your time and for your consideration. I'm really happy to take um, any questions. Thanks very much, Fiona. As, as Alan Kavner says, what an amazing presentation and, and your, your slides will be available. Um, there's another question here from Fabian Tramondi. And he's asking, how, how can I get involved learning more about blockchain? And normally we associate blockchain with cryptocurrencies. Um, so he's asking, how can I get involved and what would be your suggestion to get immersed in that area? That's a really great question. And there's a, there's a few different ways, right? So if you've just finished computer science, you could I would consider you a bit of a hacker. So you could kind of mess around a little bit. Um, there, um, there are a lot of blockchain implementations that have that you know, it's all open source and they have examples that you can deploy. So you, if you're a computer programmer, you can check things out yourself. Um, in terms of business and startups, I would definitely, uh, startups are also research opportunities. We're messing around in the marketplace. We're, <laughs> you know, validating new ideas, new products, new services. It's a really exciting time. And there are ways of, whether it's through internships or, you know, proving your worth and, and, and getting stuck in with, um, with blockchain startups. I would totally recommend that. <laughs> um, also, I'm the chair of the startups group. So you're very welcome to, to tag on there to see what's happening or the developers group for Blockchain Ireland. But aside from that, there are a number of different education opportunities. And I know that Joyce is the, the education and skills chairperson. So she there there's a lot of um, information 
available and courses available. If you're sick of studying, um, I would just say the internet is your friend and I would network like crazy. Uh, online is fantastic. You don't just have to go to a meetup in your city. Now with Clubhouse, with meetups happening online, there's a lot of different events that you can participate in and, um, and absolutely get involved with emerging standards development. It is an open source process. Um, it's very knowledge focused and knowledge sharing focused. But if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, there's some really great opportunities there as well. Um, I never advise people to mess around and buy Bitcoin, but that's, that's always an option um, or, or anything else. Uh, but yeah, it's a really exciting. Um, it's a really exciting uh, uh, sector or it's really exciting uh, moment, I think, in, in this in this technology. There's a question here, I think, again, from Fabian. How can I sign up for the event tomorrow in future media and big data? That's Fabian, why don't you drop me an email? My email address is fgdelaney. It's on those slides as well. fgdelaney at gmail.com. And I'll make sure you get an invite. And the same for anybody else if they want an invite. You do have to sign up in advance. So I would need to send your emails to the guy organizing it. But it's free of charge. And there's a question here, is there any reason you choose Hyperledger over something like Morpheus Network for your own origin chain? There, uh, we don't only use uh, Hyperledger, we will use everything. Uh, we recently did a project with Corda. Um, so the reason that that use case is described using Hyperledger BESU is because that is the infrastructure that the European Commission rolls out through the EBC node infrastructure. So it's described using Hyperledger BESU. That's Thank, the only thanks, reason. Fiona. So uh, we would we pick our stack according to community needs or application needs. And there's a question from Dave saying, if anybody's interested in knowing more about ISO 56002, the Technology Ireland ICT Skills Net has a specific program called Innovation Excellence Program, which maps to the guidance standards as recommended by the NSAI. So you can contact us, uh, Dave Feenan, or look at the ICT Skills Net. That's just a, a link. There's a, a shout hello to you, uh, Fiona, from Johanna Moran. There was one other question here um, on just a general question. Is there an overall strategy focus in the current drive towards standardization? Is there a strategy focus? Yeah. Well, that's it. is there an overall strategy focus? So there's a few different ways of looking at this, right? There are multiple international and global standards development agencies or organizations. There's ISO, there's ITU, the UN itself is a standards development organization. There's IEEE and uh, W3C, uh, which is one of the original ones from the, you know, the origin, the great origins of the internet. Um, they uh, everything is set up as as like working groups technical committees with working groups and uh, that's how you drill down and contribute as individual experts in iso it's very much you are an individual expert and you represent your country um so it's geopolitical as well so there's a lot of different layers as, as to how and why people participate um uh the protectionism exists, but it's very much watered down in the sense that in ISO, the US has the same vote as Ireland. So. Thanks, Fiona. And I, I just come to our last question from Kevin Hart. I've noticed that the blockchain use cases are shared, encouraged to be shared. But at what point does an organization start protecting their developed IP as an asset for their benefit and minimize conflict? Uh, always. So I have my own startup. It didn't stop me publishing aspects of our work that are open source or available as open source. So startups, uh, inventors must always protect their IP. But it doesn't mean you can't talk about it. You can't be a business person and not talk about what you're doing. So there's a line that you walk and there's, a, um, there's some things you're willing to share and then there's some things that you're not. Mm. And it will be different for what your IP is. Thanks very much, Fiona. And that's a good point to start. I think there's been a, a great reaction to your presentation, which I think showed all the possibilities and the opportunities. 
but with both Steve and yourself, I think it was inspirational to see the positivity about blockchain, what's possible, where we can go in the future. And I think it gives us a great feeling. Steve, you talked about confidence of building up the community. And you can see from Fiona's presentation that both Europe and Ireland are very active and there's lots of cooperation and lots of opportunities. If you let me, there's there's one or two notices I just want to read from the developers group. Fiona has mentioned uh, the developers group, which is chaired by Bernard Gaughan. And there's an upcoming event on February 25th to demonstrate the creation and deployment of an Ethereum ERC20 token standard smart contract. And you can register via published link on um, the Blockchain Ireland LinkedIn page. So that would be very interesting for some of you who are asking Fiona how you can join particular groups. And we have an ongoing call for speakers. This is from Bernard again, to deliver technical talks in 2020. So this is another way of you getting involved with Blockchain Ireland and the technical group. And as Fiona says, the startup group, the education and training group, all are really interested in your participation. And I know Dara will be waiting patiently for all your uh, requests to volunteer and also to participate in Blockchain Week. So um, I think we're coming to an end to today's uh, session. I'd like to thank Sarah Weston from the production team and Technology Ireland ICT Skillnet. You managed very well with all the wind and all the things. So thanks a million, Sarah. Um, and thank you again to our audience who, for your active participation. We could have gone on much longer, but time just caught up on us. Um, we'll see you all again on the 23rd of March. And following on uh, from Fiona's team, we'll be looking at Europe, Europe's blockchain strategy and development. And we'll also have a, a speaker from Slovenia who'll be looking at government services and how they are developed based on blockchain technologies. So until we see you on the 23rd of March, stay well and keep safe. And thank you very much again for attending and to our two speakers, Fiona and Steve. Thanks for watching. You might be interested to know we are now taking expressions of interest for our Masters in Blockchain, which will commence September 2021. Just email your CV to info at ictskillnet.ie.